So welcome, this is Jeff the Big Hairy Dog and this is a, a webinar on um, VA tech support. And I just threw the um, agenda up on the screen so we don't have to look at the website. Um, so it's about version eight. Version eight, our database is a flat file system. And um, uh, so um, obviously the first thing I would always do is reboot. Uh, there, sometimes you have um, errors in Retail Pro that have to do with the memory of the computer and uh, the smart move is to reboot. You can also just stop Retail Pro and try it again. But if you get um, some of those errors, I'm, I'm just gonna point out that before you call tech support, you probably should just restart the PC and see if it's gone because that's probably the first thing we're gonna do. Um, so next, let's talk about uh, like errors in the file structure. So the most common situation in Retail Pro um, is absolutely like an error in the file structure. So let's let's just go down and, and find, um, well, let's just open this up a little so we can see what we're doing. And uh, let's go like this. All right, so there's your inventory file right there. Inventory is actually, um, consists of more than one file. So you see here invindat and then invin, uh, extra so that's the addition that's description three and four that's the additional fields but um, so one common error is that you can get a corrupted file or a corrupted index so what we're gonna do is we're gonna fake it by um, by just renaming this right so we're gonna just rename the index file here which will cause an error in retail pro so so that says we we have a problem and we don't have Retail Pro open anymore because my virtual machine died. So let's just go ahead and launch it. We'll get an error right right away. See, it says that there's missing or damaged files. Even IX is missing or damaged in this case. So um, now what it's doing when this occurs, when you get that error, it's going to immediately launch RProDB. Now RProDB is and that was weird. I don't know if you guys noticed that, but this this box came up like underneath the splash screen. So that would make it difficult. It was waiting for us to sign in. We were waiting for it to pop up. We'd be kind of caught there. I just clicked on the bottom one to bring it up. Uh, anyway, by opening and closing RProDB, it will have replaced that file. So, um, Invin IX is back and has file size again. See, so just just by opening R Pro and saying yes, go ahead and and try and fix or replace the file, R Pro DB does that. So now now we're in the main menu. Are we in the main menu? Let's see. Okay, so we're done. It's still loading. Okay, now we're going to sign in. Of course, we're going to break it again. We're going to break it a couple times here. Make sure that everybody's comfortable on on how you fix it right that's kind of the whole point as far as i can tell um yeah right my my um my demo is already reset today so we're good all right so we're at the main menu of retail pro so we're gonna go we're gonna go break it again Okay, invin ix. So there's our ix file. Well, we don't need to save it. Um, well, it's probably enough. Yep. All right, so it's gone. It's just completely gone. Now, if we try and go and do something in Retail Pro, right. So we we're getting a, a, an error on that file, right? So um, we could manually go to tools and launch our pro DB. And really that's the first thing you should do. If you have an error on version eight, you should launch our pro DB and see if it fixes it, right? And of course now the file has been replaced again, same process we did a minute ago and it's totally fine, right? Um, why can't I minimize that? 
That's weird. All right. Um, of course, we're going to break it again. Now, if you have to manually fix it, like if, if we got the error, we can't get in, we're broken. You can also go to the reconstruct tool, which usually appears in this regular menu. My menu may be tweaked a bit. So um, the reconstruct tool, though, uh, is, is the way you would manually attack that, right? So the reconstruct tool, we know in this case that it's, it's invin, right? So I'm just going to type invin, and I'm going to grab the invin dat file, put it over there and say that we want to re-index. Now, probably I would reconstruct the thing fully um, in that um, if you're going to take the time to re-index, you may as well just do a full reconstruct. If I re-index it, it will build that index file. I mean, I, I re-deleted the index file. It would put it back. Uh, but if I do a full reconstruct, it'll check the file structure and re-index it. So I'm just going to go all the way and, and do it manually. So, um, right. Should, now, does, does anybody have to be out of R Pro to do the DB? I know they do have to be out of for reconstruct. You are 100% correct. Another way to phrase that would be to say that you need exclusive access to the file structure. Like nobody else can be playing with the, the files. So for, for instance. For as well, for the correct. database. Oh yeah, for okay. our project. So, so now we fix the problem, right? And so we're in. Uh, now let's go back and look at what happens if we try this while we're using, like we're driving the car and we're, we're trying to work on the engine here at the same time, right? That's what we're doing. Now in this case here, it's gonna do that. Now, the reconstruct truck tool is it's just not that smart, okay? It only has one error. It's a fatal error. Right. And that's not a fatal error. It's a sharing violation. The file's in use. We don't have exclusive access, and it's pouting. So, so this could happen, though. You, if you're on the, the, the server and somebody else goes in at point of sale and you don't know it, you're going to get a fatal error. Now, if, if you're doing this, if you're back here and you say, um, like, I'm going to do a reconstruct on, uh, like, maybe all the files or a great many files. So I, could, I could say I'm going to do all of the inventory files, right? So I could say, uh -huh. boom, there's inventory, do all those files, start. And anyway, you get an error that says fatal error on 120 files. Okay, somebody went in. There's no way that 120 files are damaged, right? <laughs> Very common, by the way. Right, so so, so between the reconstruct tool and the R Pro DB, and the R Pro DB is very useful. So I don't want to discount the R Pro DB. Uh, one time I, I got an error on the PO file, it was a tech call. I reconstructed, the, they had reconstructed the PO file, I reconstructed it. We still got the error. I ran R Pro DB. It told me that, 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 that the error was actually on PO quantity which is a subset file of the PO file, right? So it wasn't on the PO file, even though it said it was in the basic error message, it said it was PO.dat, PO0000.dat, PO 0000 dot dat, was actually on, a, on like a PO quantity file, which I'm not even seeing here right at the moment. Uh, it's usually hanging around here, but the point is that our pro DB identified the correct file, and then I was able to reconstruct the right file, and then of course that fixed the problem. So, um, R Pro DB is definitely your friend. You want to definitely always have that one in your um, back pocket. All right, so um, so obviously reboot first, run R Pro DB and or reconstruct as you need to. Uh, check shortcuts, right? So so the shortcuts. Um, if your shortcuts don't have a okay, whatever. Not sure why we can't. Can we always exit here? It seems to be angry. Um, your shortcuts should have a um, should have a start in. If they don't have a start in, that can cause problems too. So, uh, as a regular course, I would make sure that all your shortcuts. I mean, that's something you can do proactively. You don't have to do that reactively. You could just go and make sure all your shortcuts have a, a start in, right? I mean, I would. Um, in this case here, what I've done also on the screen is 
I have gone and taken an extra minute and gone in and found like like R Pro DB, right? So there's the executable, and and then I um I just right clicked it and dragged over and said create a shortcut here, and then I I made the shortcut prettier by deleting the fact that it said shortcut on there. Um, so you could create shortcuts to both tools outside of Retail Pro. Like you don't have to go through the menu to get to those. Like you can just launch them right from here and go in. And on the back workstation or on the server, I would absolutely have one of those set up. Save you having to drill in and find it. No reason not to really. All right, so um, right, confirming backups. Backups are important. I, I can't stress enough. Confirm your backups. Um, you should have uh, some software that's uh, doing that. It could be, could be. We we recommend two levels of backups. I would want you to be backing up uh, to a local file, like a local disk, uh, and it might be an external hard drive, and then you might swap that hard drive out and take it home and swap. You keep swapping them out every week or every month. Um, you can use a, uh, you know, uh, one of those uh, iBackups or Mosey Pro or Carboni. There's a slew of online backups. Now that's a that's a never-ending fee, right? You're, you're you're renting the space in the cloud forever, basically. So, um, but it happens automatic, which I'm not sure happening automatic is a good thing. I'm going to point out that many people have set that up and never checked it, only to find that it failed six months ago when they need it. So whatever you do, you, you gotta have in your schedule a monthly, like check your backup, like the first of the month, I don't care, the 15th, pick a day, right? Um, but you gotta know your backups are happening. You gotta go up to the cloud and ensure that there's a file up there that has file size. And if you open up the thing, uh, does it have the right files in it? I don't know what else to say. Now, if the manually backup, since we're here, we're looking at the database. Um, if you sort this V8 database by type, here are all the executables. Skip, 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 skip the DLLs. Uh, INI files. Now, INI files, only a few of these matter, but a few of them matter. So, um, like the most important one, I think, is this one here. Maybe the reports one. No, that's not it. There's one in here that's really pretty important. Oh, it's this one, rprouii.ini. So there's a lot of settings that they started putting in here that the tra tailing end of version eight, they, they started using this for some of the preferences. So um, so what I do is I, I really need to get two file types, but if you if you grab the INIs, then three, right? So if I start here, uh, the first INI, keeping it simple here, like I don't wanna like hurt myself, right? And I hold the shift key down, I can just down page down here, one page at a time. Now there's the DAT files. I need the data files. That's what I'm backing up. That is the, the primary thing I'm backing up. The next thing we're gonna see is IX files, or excuse me, not IX files, but uh, DIA files. And then the IX files is the next one. Now the DIA files, they're temporary network locking files. They're tiny, they're 2K, 3K, right? I, I just go ahead and grab them because I want these IX files. And I don't want to have to cherry pick all, all, all of it out. So if I have to manually back up the data, like something's going down and it's very bad and I need to do it, I would do that. I would right click. I would say, you know, maybe either copy or send a compressed file. And it'll, it'll compress all the data. Now, compression could take a while, depending on how much data you have. Right? So, um, I don't have that much. This is a sandbox. It's got junk data in it. I'm not sure it's even worth compressing. But that being said, that's a down and dirty manual backup. Now, all that grabs is your data, right? So um, you might also want to grab the layouts out of one of the workstation directories, the reports folders, and um, the doc design folder. So if you were going to manually like get your your stuff out the ex, the executables we can give you you can download those like we can reinstall retail pro easily we can find your license file that's not a big deal but your data i can't replace that the doc designs we can replace but that'll take work 
Same with the screens. We can replace the screens, but that'll take work as well. Same with reports. So this is taking way too long. All right, so while this is going, let's just scroll up here real quick uh, and take a look. So in the design folder, there's a doc design folder. I've got a lot of them because I squirrel around with this all the time. That's the only active one. So I would copy that one right there and put that someplace if I was going to back that up. In um, in the workstation subfolders, and the problem is every workstation can have a different layout, right? But pick the best workstation, the one, the point of sale one that you use all the time, and and grab the layouts folder. And then of course the uh, other thing which would be nice is these two: report filters and report win reports and win filters. These two here together make your reports. The other one, if you have groups, scheduled groups or groups that you've scheduled or groups that you run manually, that would be the GRP folder. And so these are all groups that I've set up at one time or another. I have way too many. Um, but that, the GRP folder and these two folders here would, would back up all your reports. So then from there, we could pretty much rebuild our pro. Uh, be careful of this one here. Secure doc is a form of backup. It's really quite small. I've seen this be three, four gigabytes. The data in there can be used to reconstruct transactional history. If I restored a backup from three days ago, I could use secure doc to rebuild the last three days. But if, if your whole database is down and you're just trying to, or your computer is dying, you don't need the, you don't need to back up the backup. You need the data. If that makes sense to everybody. So yeah. anyway, um, all right. So then, um, so yeah, make a plan on the backups. I, I just cannot stress that enough. Um, obviously, um, if we're talking about basics of hardware, then um, yes, check the power cables, check all the connections before you call tech support. There's nothing worse than, and I've had that tech call, by the way. I've had a guy go off on me about the keyboard and right in the middle of yelling at me, he said, oh, the keyboard is not plugged in. <laughs> I mean, you know, I don't want to be that guy. I know that nobody out there wants to be that guy. I've, I've been that guy. I've called the retail pro on, on things and had them get all cocky on me. So um, anyway, dumping a printer. Does everybody know how to dump a printer? To dump a printer, basically what you do is you, you turn it off completely off. This is mostly point of sale receipt printers, by the way, but it works on laser printers too and other kinds of printers. You sometimes on the laser and on the on the inkjets there's a like a reset key, but but the basic point of sale receipt printer, you turn it off, then you take the feed key and hold it down and turn it back on. And when you do that, you let go of the feed key then and it'll, it'll spit out a bunch of like what's the BIOS setting and what what version of software is it on and etc cetera, etc, cetera, right? It'll spit all that out. And then it'll say press the, the feed key to, to continue, and you press the feed key. Then it does a print test pattern that looks like a like a barber shop like twirly thing. You know what I mean? It just they diagonal lines of print going down the page, uh, and then it's done. And when, what that does is it clears the memory on the printer. Right now, um, if you're having a print problem, that can that can fix it because your printer may printer is a little computer right I'm, I'm sorry to say it's absolutely needs to be cleared memory does need to be cleared sometimes now the other thing is about 30 or 40 percent of our clients use what's called uh, parallel uh, cash drawers or um, piggybacked or pass through whatever you want to call them right so you got a computer nobody laugh at my art my art is not great okay but it, it gets us by communication is what we're here to do right so we got our computer we've got Mr. Printer plugged in to the computer, right? So got our little printer sitting here ready to print receipts, so to speak. Um, and then what happens is, of course, that's that's plugged into the, um, the power as well, right? It goes into the wall, a little Edison plug. Um, but then we have a little RJ12 telephone like connector that comes out of here and goes over to the cash drawer, right? And plugs into the cash drawer. Now. That's a pass through so that this cash drawer here, which is going the wrong direction, but whatever, um, is, is actually getting its signal through the printer. So if the printer is confused, it could result in the cash drawer not popping in that scenario. 
and I, I a great many people. Now we don't we don't promote that. What we recommend is what's a, a serial cash drawer. In a serial cash drawer, it gets a a, a com port cable plugged right into the cash drawer directly. So there is no there's no pass through anything, right? If if the if the cash drawer is not working, it's because there's a problem with the cash drawer. That's it. So that's the two options with 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 cash drawers. And obviously, in a cash drawer situation, these serial ones they also have a little they have a little um you know a little like a 12 volt converter plug. You know what I mean? So it goes over and so with these, the first thing you check is is that power supply. I'm going to tell you now. Cash drawers also, since we're on the topic, they have a solenoid. So a uh, solenoid is used to hold the charge. So there is a um, there is a little lever in there. It's a little hook. Obviously, you push the cash drawer in, it clicks the hook, right? So what's got to happen for the cash drawer to open is it we got to pull the hook out of the way and let the cash drawer pop out, right? Well, to do that, we need some serious amperage for all of about a split second, right? So what they, they do is they charge a solenoid up and the solenoid sits charged. And when you say open the cash drawer, then boom, it releases that energy, right? So what I'm saying is that the solenoid could be charged. Somebody could bump this cable here and knock this cable out just enough so that the solenoid can't recharge. The cash drawer would still open once. So I've had people say, well, yeah, somebody bumped the cash drawer earlier this morning, but it opened since then. Yeah, it opened this, but only once, right? All right, enough with the scribble art for the moment. Um, workstation preferences. Yeah, workstation preferences are definitely kind of a an area, aren't they? So, um, by the way, this is all versions of Retail Pro, not just Retail Pro 8. Um, workstation preferences are pretty solid. You, you got to... You got to know your way around the basics in, in workstation preferences, or or you do dumb things that result in tech calls, which you shouldn't have. Um, paths. Right off the bat, these paths are critical that they're right. If one of these gets screwed up, you could be in trouble. Now, some of these are irrelevant, like the path to your your emails. You don't really need that. Here's your homepage URL. You see, I I pointed my homepage URL towards. Uh, a little retail, you know, big hairy dog, best friend retailer thing, right? So those two aren't critical, but uh, the path to the sales file, the path to your, your credit card processing are critical. Those two are critical. If those are wrong, you could have a problem. I've had people that screw this up here, and what happens is that uh, all the sales from a given workstation are going to a different place. They're being saved in different files. And then we have to go and merge the two files after the fact. So, like, just I would make sure that uh, those are right. Now, the best way to make sure that they're right is to only have one path. So, what I mean by that is um, if you have a server, and on the server you have on the hard drive, you have a C drive, and then we usually set up like a Q drive, and then we set up a native R drive. Okay. And we choose R for a reason. And not just because it's retail pro, but that is kind of why we do it, right? Obviously, but but R is so far down the alphabet that that it won't be bumped by any other hardware. That doesn't happen so much in Windows 7 and above. But back in the day, uh, a lot of the earlier Windows operating systems, if you installed a piece of hardware like a, a DVD player, it would bump. It would take the next logical drive letter. It would take D. It would take E. It would take F. And so it would bump anything else down, and that would screw up Retail Pro. So we picked R a long time ago to make sure we're at the bottom of the alphabet, right? Now, the other workstations, when we set up the workstations that talk to Mr. Server, right, we set up a C, a Q, and a D drive, because the hard drive drive space here isn't critical. We're not running in a program off of it per se. It's just a storage area. Then we set up a mapped drive where we map our R drive back to the native R drive, right? So now, if I do all my workstations that way, everybody has one path, R retail 8 rpro.exe, right? That's it. That is the path. There is no other path. And that's a beautiful thing because in TechSupport, if you see anything other than the path, 
then you know that's the that's the problem. So you don't have to do that. Certainly, you can choose to not do that. But um, I'm going to say that's a good it's a good plan. It's worked for us for a long time. Um, all right, what else is in here is important. Um, we got an auto lockout right here. You can you can lock out people after. Don't go 15. Don't go two. Go five. I wouldn't go much lower than five. If you do integrated credit card processing and somebody gets like really remedial on the pin pad, you could get a lockout that stops you from accepting the credit card processing thing because they went too long. So you're in catch 22. You can't accept the transaction, but they but you can't unlock it because the the credit card machine's prompting and you can't see it. So anyway, that's an ugly one. Uh, not much there. I would I would. would tell you about it in tech support um, this one actually I would recommend the scheduler here um, if you run the retail pro scheduler and it's important if it's running reports if it's doing polling if it's doing anything that you need to do and if it fails it's a problem then you turn on the monitor that just means when you launch retail pro it's gonna say hey the scheduler is not working do you want me to restart it and it says it, you know, it'll restart in 30 seconds you just click start now but yes, anywhere where you run the Retail Pro Scheduler, and you can see I'm not running the Retail Pro Scheduler right now. There's nothing down there. Um, if we if we get out of here and go to Tools and say R Pro Scheduler, it pops the scheduler in down there, and now I'm running the Retail Pro Scheduler. But it's an application. It could fail. Windows could get angry at it, whatever, right? Um, okay, so what else in here is important? Under Documents, there's a few, not much actually. There's a few things right here that are kind of critical. Um, you know, I don't, I don't use this setting and I don't use this setting much ever. These are old settings. If this gets checked off, all your vouchers go into uh, pending. And if you're not, you're not intending to use pending vouchers, that's a problem. So um, if this here gets checked off and you change price levels, then it just keeps that price level until you exit the receipt area and come back in fresh. So again, those are just basically two little problems waiting to happen. Um, this one here is just a good practice to to not be to print zero quantity items on SOs and fees. This should be unchecked. I think it defaults to checked, by the way. Um, that gets into a whole big conversation about security and whether you let items be deleted off the receipt, which I don't. Uh, or I make them zero the quantity out, which I do. Uh, and then I don't print them because the customer doesn't need to see them, right? I uh, don't care about uh, document franking. That's a very expensive printer. Uh, there's an email setting, but we're not really talking about email settings. We're talking about tech support right now. Um, EFT, of course, this is huge. What, whatever the option is that you're using, know your option. Know how to set that up. Know where to put the, the IP and stuff. There's the, really, it's just Cayenne now for the most part, uh, but you could have an older version of Retail Pro that still might use Shift 4 or um, there's a whole plethora. We went through an ugly decade of, of various credit card processing for a long time there, but um, they picked Cayenne because they wanted to take credit card processing out of the computer completely. So uh, when you have the integrated credit card, what you're really paying for with Cayenne is PCI compliance because it makes a request to the pin pad. The pin pad talks directly to the processor. The pin pad gets the approval, sends back just a little bit of information we get. So we don't get the whole credit card number. There's no credit card data in our computer. Our computer and our network are out of scope for a PCI audit. Um, very good thing. All right, so anyway, moving on. Um, yeah, sequences and reports, not much there. And reports, there is this here. I would seriously recommend that you check off that thing, but that's just a reporting function. Uh, peripherals, um, again, know your peripherals. Everybody's got different shopper displays or different kinds of cash drawers. Know, know if it's serial or it's parallel, right? Or if it's OPAS, and know how your cash drawer is set up. Go in and take screenshots, understand while it's working, know how it's supposed to be set up so that you can check it if it's not working. Also, if you're using OPAS, <coughs> you'll have a an OPAS application in your program, I don't have an OPAS driver loaded, but it would say like MMF cash drawer, OPAS driver or something in here, right? It would it would show you, and then you could go in and pop that open, and, and from there you could 
you could actually see if it's configured correctly and test to the cache drawer and make it pop open. So again, with peripherals, everybody's peripherals are different. Know your peripherals, know how your settings are. That's what's important to you. Printing, of course, printing is always a problem. So, okay, so with every section, like receipts being one of the most important, there is this thing called override. Now, in many areas like purchasing, vouchers, transfers, all of those areas, I would check the override in version 8. There is no override in version 9, by the way. They do away with this, which is both good and bad. I like the override. So with receipts, I often do not use it. So if, if you're not using it, that means a receipt, a new receipt, would print one way to a given printer, which we have to check off. You don't want two or three check marks, or you're going to get two or three print jobs, right? Then you have to pick your design, right? Whatever the design might be. Holy moly, there's a lot of designs in here. Right, so anyway. Um, then for a former receipt, for a reprint, right, we may choose to have a different design, and it may say this is a reprint, right? That would be the, that would be the point of, of, of not using the override, is that when I reprint a transaction, I get a different design from when I print an SO deposit or a credit card draft. Now, the credit card drafts, we don't print those anymore, really. So, um, so this is all about making sure that whatever that workstation does, whether it be a receipt, right, or be, uh, let's see here, can we, can we go down a little bit? SOs, uh, everything's here. POs, vouchers, transfer orders, transfer slips, everything's here. So um, inventory tags, right? Everything's here. And XCOT, I passed XCOT, I think. Yeah, right there. So whatever you print, you want to make sure it's set up. And you also want to make sure that whatever doc design you pick. So if you pick a doc design over here, like SQUA 40, you want to make sure that the access level on that is set down to like level four or whatever level your cashiers are allowed to see. So uh, real quick here, let's uh, cancel out of here. Let's go to um, let's go to tools. Let's go to document design and let's go to receipts since that's the most common scenario this would occur and pick a receipt where this is the one we were playing with earlier. That looks kind of wild. All right. So um, what I would be interested in is this over here, right? The access level on the receipt. If this was set up to sysadmin, but my, my security groups, they could only see level two and three or four. They couldn't see the design. It's not going to be able to print. It's going to pop a weird menu. It's going to say, pick a design. There might not even be a design in the box. Might be a blank box that says, pick a design. They can't. That's pretty common, by the way. So usually once you fix it, though, it goes away forever. So, but that's, that's the lay of the land in, in, in workstation preferences. Um, I don't see any questions typed into the chat and Christy's got the, the phone. So, she, and I, I don't hear anything coming out of there. So I guess we will consider moving on to DVS. DVS, yes, hours of endless enjoyment there. Um, so DVS, by the way, there's more in DVS than we could cover. In, in a, in a two-hour appointment. But data verification is DVS, right? And um, and there's a great many things in there. There's a ton of stuff in DVS. Um, what they're asking us to go over here, and we can go over other things that we think we need to, is these two, item and style, SID. Um, so obviously, we've got to ask the obvious question, does anybody know what a SID is? And um, a SID is a system ID. And um, so a system ID is used to track the unique, a unique record. So the item number is not unique enough because I could use that item number in inventory then I could clean house on that and reuse that item number, right? So over a long period of time, an item number is not a unique enough mark. And even UPC codes can be reused. There's a 
legal requirement to wait three years, but still a UPC code could be recycled, right? So it's not a unique enough mark if you see where I'm going. So Retail Pro generates a SID, an uh, system ID is what it is. And for an item, there's two. If it's part of a style, then all the member, style members have the same SID. If it's a unique item like a shot class, it only comes one way, then it's got a unique style and a unique item SID, right? Now, why is it important to run DVS and look at these? There's a whole, there's a whole advanced uh, item and style SID thing here. So the way Retail Pro A works, and this is kind of cool, but um, I'm not sure it, it, it lines up with the newer relational database is the problem. Um, so when you sell an item, it takes the item's description and writes it to the sales history. So my sales history is solid. It's fully reportable whether or not I even have the inventory file. Like I could delete the item, clean house it out of, and Retail Pro 8 had to work this way, by the way, because it's a flat file system. And if the files get to be too big, they blow up. So you can't have a million items in your inventory, right? So mm -hmm. in, in the relational database in, in version nine, of course, you can have a million items in your inventory and, and you designate whether it's active or inactive. And if it's inactive, it's not being searched. It's not being indexed. It's not part of the club, but it's still there. So we don't actually have to write the descriptive information to history. So what happens when we write descriptive information to history and we edit the description in inventory, we change it. We put a season code on it. We change the season code. We, we change a, an, an auxiliary field to indicate that it's now a markdown item, right? We, we change the description, right? So now it writes to history. We change it in inventory. It writes to history again, but now it's a different version in history, isn't it? Well, so the relational database can't do that. You, you can't have two descriptions for one item. That's a no, just a hard, a hard stop no to get to version nine. So uh, also, by the way, if it's a typo, if you if you typed in description two wrong, uh, you know, typed in something basic like polo, but you are typing too quick and you got pool instead of polo, you're like, oh, yeah, all right. The L is supposed to come before the O. All right, so you go fix it, right? <clears throat> now you run reports and it breaks out funny in reports and shows you both different versions because that original bad description is still out there reporting for those first sales that were captured. And honestly, I don't even know if I have a problem in this database. I may have cleaned all the all the stuff up too much. So we should go make a problem, right? So if we go and make a problem, let's just take any item. We'll take item number one, right? And we will click OK on that, and we will sell it. So we will go to tender and cash and update only uh i prefer to do update only don't really want to keep faking print jobs all right so we sold item number one today and now now we're going to go hack it up of course because that's what we do um okay so we're going to change the item number one uh, we're going to click edit and six shots set. Um, we'll take the word set off. We'll say six shot box. Yeah. Woohoo. Uh, and we'll say over here, we'll do a little B. Okay. So we changed it, right? Save. And if we go back to POS receipts, new, you can sell it now. And it's angry at me, but we'll choose number one and tender and cash and we're good. Update only. Okay, so it definitely would now break out. If I were to run a report on that, it would break out differently if we were grouping by the descriptive or the style number, right? So uh, if we go into DVS now and we go over to advanced and we go to item SID and style SID, we'll start with item SID. And yes, I'm a certified technician and the password, and we need to look at this password thing here. It's probably sysadmin. Yes, it was sysadmin. But on that point, the DVS passwords are managed in a rather odd way. So here in Retail Pros folder where the data files exist, 
right? If we're sorted alphabetically, we find the DVS executable in this neighborhood, I think. Or I just type DV and it should find us for it. You see that right below it is a DVS INI, and there's your passwords. So the default expiration date on the passwords is 2010. So you see mine have been bumped to 2020, but even that's not going to hold for much longer, right? So if you if you check your DVS INI, you want to probably go right to um, uh, find and replace, and you want to find 2010, or in this case, 2020, right? And replace it with like 2030, right? Replace all, boom. Now your expiration thing goes away, and you just file save. If you want to change the passwords, you can. I don't know why. I mean, item two, item three, sysadmin. Sysadmin's on all of them. If that's a problem, change sysadmin and put in your own password. Make it be admin sys. Who cares, right? All right, so I'm in here, and I'm reading history, and um, you may or may not want to read all history. Um, I probably don't want to read all history. Um, well, I'll read all history to begin with. We'll see what happens. Um, we are reading orders and we're ignoring these fields here. So if you have a field that you change all the time, you can choose to ignore it. Um, I'm going to say yes, save the changes. And it's finding a bunch of duplicates because this data is uh, fairly crappy. All right, so this is perfect. This is what we want to see. Now, um, those are system IDs, SIDs on the left, right? And some items have two conflicts, and some have three, and some have 16 or 25. So in this case, this item with this SID was changed and, and, and used over and over again. Now, uh, very important, on the, on the right here, you see all the H's. The H's are easy to see. Everybody sees the H's. But nobody sees the I, right? So the very top one, there is a green eye in that field. And it's really difficult to see on that background. But there's a slightly greener looking line right here. Really difficult to see. The I stands for inventory, the H stands for history, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, what this is doing for us is doing a lot of the heavy lifting here. It's put a capital M on the, on the I. By the way, you can't, you can't match to history. You can match history to history, but not inventory to history. Like, so I could, I could say, make this one a master, but I could not say, match this one to that. That's, a, that's, a, that's a, again, a hard no. So, so it's done. Like, so when we look at this item, uh, the DCS changed, right? So something changed, clearly something changed, right? And it's identified that it was a simple change, that it's okay with it, that everything else looks the same. And it's like, okay, the inventory is obviously the right plan. plan. We're going to match everything to inventory, right? And that's what all these are doing. Here we, we've changed T to T party, right? I'm not even sure what changed on that one. Probably in uh, description one or something, right? Oh, yeah, there we go. So, like you look, what you're looking for here is you're looking for one that was not chosen correctly, right? You're looking for something that that shouldn't be grouped. That's what you're looking for. And if you find something and you say, "Oh no, this bouquet should be its own thing," then you have to master that. Now you get the little key there on the SID, the little lock, and that says it's going to generate a new system ID for that. It's going to change the system ID and make it its own item from here to this point forward, but I, I really don't care about that. We are, I'm totally good to clean that up. Um, what I'm also looking for here is something that does not get auto-resolved. Do we have anything here? Apparently not. Okay, so. Um, right, so see here on the, on, the, on the left now, I unmarked that we've got a yellow triangle. So if you get a yellow triangle, that means you, it can't make the decision. We didn't get any because this data is not that good. 
So I had to forcibly make one. But sometimes I'll see like a group of those, three or four, 10, 12. I've seen, I've seen hundreds actually. But um, if you get hundreds and if they have to do with department and vendor, then call a technician. There's a trick we can do with the, um, the other side of the module here that can kind of um, eliminate those. But um, anything that's got a, a, a yellow triangle, you have to physically go to. You'll find that it's gray like that. You'll have to highlight. You'll have to highlight the the gray item, right? You'll be you'll be focused here. You'll have to focus there, and you'll have to say match or master, right? To resolve that. All right. So if we say next, then uh, do you want do you want? So it, it's gonna re, it's gonna resolve those duplicates. But now it wants to check for a duplicate item. A duplicate item is not a duplicate SID, right? Everybody gets that. Let me just make sure we're all on the same page on that one, 100%. Okay, so um, a duplicate SID is this record here existing in version one and then existing in version two, right? So it's the same item. A duplicate item is actually a duplicate item. It's like row 100 and row 200 were completely redefined to be exactly the same. Very hard to do, by the way. There's a lot of built-in things that stop you from doing that in Retail Pro. Um, you can do it with an import tool. Absolutely do it with an import tool. There's no safeguards on importing. Um, so so there are ways to accomplish this. So, so then usually the answer is going to be yes, I want to check for duplicate items. Most of the time it doesn't find any, but this one's finding some, it looks like. Yes, yeah, so this is ugly. Um, we're not going to take the time in a training here to go through and I don't know where this data came from, but yes, the same thing here, right? You'd have to go through these one at a time and decide what you're going to do with these, these problems, right? I'm just going to go ahead and say next. It's going to tell me not all conflicts have been resolved and I'm going to go ahead and continue because this isn't about you guys watching me check off little boxes. This is about understanding how the tool works, right? So, um, now. That should have resolved our little issue. So let's go back. Oh, wrong version. Sorry. Um, let's go back into here. It's going to pop up and get obnoxious in a minute on that V9 thing. Um, huh. Did I, screw, did I screw my path up? Maybe I did. I don't remember changing it though. Yeah. Like I don't see any history in here. Hmm. Hmm. No, that's definitely not our data. Yeah, I'm a little confused, but, um, you know, it happens to the best of us, right? I just want to see what happens here if we go like that. Okay, so so that data is writing to the wrong place. There is a path problem on this. Uh, options, workstation preferences. C Retail Pro 8. C Retail Pro 8. Well, that's oddly embarrassing. Right, so since we're here, um, SA stands for sales, right? And um, 2019 is the year, right? And then the month follows. That's the naming convention for a sales history file, right? And this shows it was written to like a second ago. Yeah, um, not sure I'm gonna freak out about it and waste all of your time because my my little VM here is is having a, a bad moment. But the the system ID it would have been correct. So what it what it, what it should have done, what we should have seen, and I think it's probably did do this. It's just I can't see the history for some reason. Um, 
and it, it, it would have corrected. So I changed it from set to box, right? So everything would have been matched to the inventory. All history would now say box. It would just rip through and clean everything up. And there would be only one description of that item. So the first time you do this, it's painful. I'm just going to tell you. If you've never cleaned your data and you go do an item SID, and if you do an item SID, you got to do a style SID, by the way, because there's another level there that has to be cleaned as well. Now, if you do an item SID, it'll clean up most, a lot of the style SID stuff will get cleaned up, but you got to go run the style one too. See, it's finding duplicate style problems, even though we cleaned up the item level. And this one's not as pretty, not as clean. I would have to go through and, and, and master or match all these, right? Now, you know what? There's an opportunity here. I just realized. Um, so if I click here and I click all the way over here and then I click all the way over here, it's like a yo-yo. It's a lot of, there's a too, too big a throw here going on, right? Then I got to go back over here and then I got to go back to here. And then I got to go back here. So I'm going to right click the menu and go to menu designer. And I'm going to go to match here. And on the keyboard, I'm going to press enter. When I press enter, I get a little box on the right that lets me set a shortcut up. So I'm going to hold down the control key and press F2 and press enter. So now I have assigned a shortcut key and I have to warn you that this is a lot easier on a PC, but I'm not on a PC. I'm on a Mac. So um, my using a, a control key is a bit tricky, but the point is that I could click here and I could then do a control F2, right? And then I could just pop over here and go like that, and I could do control F2. So if you have your your um, like left hand on the keyboard holding down control and F2, right? You can just get control F2 pretty fast, like with your thumb and your like middle finger or something. But then you're just mousing between here and here, and you're doing that control F2. Of course, I have to do a control function F2 on, on a Mac to make that work. but but they'll speed up the process is what I'm getting at. Instead of having to fly back and forth across the screen all over the place. So, um, yeah, we're not going to finish those, right? That's just ridiculous. So it fixed all the ones that were there. Now, this is also another trick, shall we say, that I have seen people do. Like, instead of like hopping around the file, like execute it, then go back and have it reanalyze. What will happen is all of the, 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 all of the triangles will now be together, right? Because I've eliminated all the other errors. So now all that's going to be left is all of the errors together in one nice, neat list. So if, if it's a really long list and there are like thousands of, things in the menu, but there's only a few hundred of these. Yeah, execute it, fire it off, let it fix the ones it can, right? Then come back on the second pass and then they're all together. They're all in nicely grouped for you, ready to go. Now, the same thing could be done on customers. I would do it on customers. This It's not a part of our uh, menu, but, but customer names change, customer addresses change, right? Mm -hmm. So, so the same thing could happen on a customer. You could run a report, and depending on how you're, you're sorting it, like if you're sorting by zip code, one customer could fall into two zip codes if they lived in two zip codes, right? All right, so, um, all right, polling, basic overview. Yeah, got to love polling. Hours of endless enjoyment on that one. Um, and polling, oddly, has gotten better and better and better. Um, version 6, we thought it was, like, beautiful. Didn't think there was anything wrong with it. In version 7, they found a whole bunch of errors in version 6 when they reprogrammed it for version 7. And again in 8, and again in 9. And so in 9, even, they graduated to sending confirmation files. So they send the file over, and it kicks back a confirmation file. And if it doesn't get the confirmation file, it keeps resending the data. They've really got it nailed down. And then, of course, Prism is, the architecture is completely different. It's like subscribing to a website. It's just trickle feed polls all day. But, all right, polling. 
So polling, we have station files. A station file is like a, a description of how I talk to the other side, right? That's what that is. So uh, if I got two locations um, and I've got a, a main and a remote, um, the main would have a station file that describes the remote and the remote has a station file that describes the main. If I have more than one remote, I would have another station file here that would describe that remote and what I send to it and a station file here that would describe that main, right? So each remote would only have one station file, but a main could have many. So what we're getting to is kind of what the, we call uh, the wagon wheel. That's not a great wagon wheel. Um, but the point is that the spokes are the stores, right? And the hub is the main, right? So if this store here wants to talk to this store over here, it does it through the main, right? And that's still a solid, solid method of polling. Version nine, all the rules, all the locks, all the workstation locks, all the crap that you get in version eight polling that they were trying to prevent piracy with, they just got rid of all of them. There's, so in version nine, you could do stupid things like you could have a main here and you could have a store here and you could have some stores here and you could say, I want to pull here and I want to pull these into here and then I want to pull uh, that to there and I want this to also pull to, a, to an accounting office. I mean, you could just set up some really complicated, really bad stuff, right? So um, when we've seen a few, a few situations like that, we almost always set it up like this. And if we want to make an accounting office a, a, a spoke here, right, then we do. And we may, in the, in, the, in the station file, we may say that this spoke here gets all the data, where this one here only gets its own stores data, right? That's our choice. That's what a station file does, right? So if I go into our station file and go to form view, I have, uh, there we go. I have a checklist. Of course, it was off the page. So this just defines my station file. This is my checklist. This says what I send to that store. Do I send inventory? And if I send inventory down to them, do I send all the inventory? No, I send the differences. But now departments, there is no, there is no difference, right? So it's all or nothing. So it's all. But then how many department codes do you have? Like four dozen tops? I mean, I've seen people that have a hundred, but still, even with a few hundred department codes, it's it's a tiny, tiny file. There's no point in managing the differences. Right? So each one of these areas has to be set up. And I gotta tell you, if you're not getting data to the other side, whether it be you're not getting inventory to the store or you're not getting receipts back to the main, you need to go and look. First thing, you gotta go look at your station file and see what's checked off. So um, with version eight, as I mentioned before, we have a flat file. A flat file means that there is a data file sitting on the hard drive. This is, a flat file. What I mean is it is a text file. Now, it is encrypted. Like if we open it up, we're not going to be able to just casually read through the file, right? Most of it is encrypted. But the point is, it's sitting there on the hard drive. Nobody's watching our back. That's why we have a reconstruct tool to fix it when it breaks. Now, the next version, they go to a, a relational database that's ODBC compliant, open database connectivity compliant. And um, we have Oracle watching our back. Now, that's cool for data structure, and it's, it's pretty cool for reports. I got to tell you, you can do some amazing stuff. But it's not so cool when you want to move the database very quickly because you got to deal with Oracle now. Version 8, I'm going to say, for all of its uh, shortcomings, um, it's extremely nimble and extremely powerful. Like I could copy the whole database, drop it into, if I copy the entire retail 8 folder, executables and everything, to another computer on the same drive letter, on the same path, it would run. I wouldn't have to install it, wouldn't have to do anything else. I could just move it over from one hard drive to another and boom, launch it, start making sales. Now, I might have to set printers up if I don't already have printers set up, right? But the database itself is extremely nimble. The flat files are very, very easy to move, very easy to back up, very easy to, to manage. But they're sitting there. 
they're sitting there unprotected, right? So sunspot causes a magnetic thing. What is a hard drive? It's it's a, it's a little piece of metal with magnetic polarized particles. So a sunspot could change the, the polarization of the particles, causing a corruption in your file. We can't explain why corruptions happen. They just happen. So anyway, um, you can, and I probably should have mentioned this before, but you can be proactive on that, right? In in the um, in the uh, reconstruct tool, I didn't mention this, but I will, I guess, mention that you can you can test for corruption, right? So I could say like it's two hours before I open. I'm going to be doing email for the next hour. Um, I'm going to, going to take go in here, set it to all, pop all the files in, set it to test mode, and fire it off. What will happen is it will get through the whole batch of those, and it will then tell you that it will come back. And let's say we, it found errors on, you know, uh, three or four files. There will be like, there will be a little medley of files like left in the box when you're finished. In which case you go boom to full reconstruct and you start a second time and it cleans all that crap up, right? Like you could do that once a month, once a quarter. I mean, you know, there's no timetable. There's no schedule. You, you definitely don't need to do it every day. You could. You can also if you wanted to. There's a way to, re, there's a way to schedule reconstruct to run every night. Uh, if you need to do that, just hook up with a tech. We can do that for you. It's pretty easy. You got, got to create a, a reconst list, and then there's certain command line parameters we have to put in there. But, but we can make our database, even though we're not an Oracle database and we're not a relational database, and we don't have anybody watching our back, we could do some proactive steps to make it better, right? All right. So back to the dreaded polling, right? So again, make sure before you call tech support. That, that if you're at a remote domain and you're not getting receipts, like I would make sure that, that it says that you're sending sending whatever the data type is you, that you're sending it. If it's set to here, that's an easy tech call for me. I'm going to say, well, if you turn it on, it'll pull. So always, and I'm, by the way, very guilty of that. I've done that. I've tried to figure out why something's not pulling and I uh, as a technician I always assume it's the hardest thing possible and it turns out to be the easiest thing possible it's not turned on and then Ken says hey you know if you turn it on it will pull so all right so in station files very important let's pop back over to the properties the the uh, login and password have to be the same at both ends Okay, this is critical. In version 8, a lot of them, if this was a 000A store or a 002A, we would make the login 002A and the password 002A. In version 9, mostly we just make this sysadmin and sysadmin. Call it good. Don't even don't even make them different. But so so if you've got stores polling, right, and you got a main over here and you got a remote over here. They both have to have the same login and the same password. So when this thing connects, it's allowed in. Very, very important. You'll, you'll get uh, authentication failed or rejected or something in the polling log. And that means your passwords aren't right. You're not getting in. So, um, but that's easy to fix. I mean, if you're not 100% sure, you can't see the password, but you could just go in both sides and change them, right? You could make them be the same. Um, also, obviously, let's let's go back to uh, cancel here. Let's go list. Um, like this one's inactive. This one's active, right? So, obviously, check your your polling menu. Make sure you're not polling with an inactive station. You forgot to go in and turn it on, right? I've done that too, by the way. All right, so. Um, Right, so basic overview, I guess we should talk about that, right? There's uh, three pieces to a polling cycle, basically, that repeats twice, right? So so if you have a main and you have a remote, that's a terrible M, I get it, but all right, that's better. 
All right, so we have a given night. We have a certain time we're kicking this off. Let's say it's 12 midnight or whatever, right? Um, what's going on on both sides? Okay, well, this side here is doing a process out. So we're, we're creating mailbags. We're compressing data into little bags. Nice little bag, huh? That they're gonna go to the main. At the same moment over here, we're opening an exchange window to accept a connection, right? So then the next step would be that we launch exchange over here, which causes a connection and is accepted by that exchange there, in which case bags are moved from remote to main, right? So that would be called the get cycle, right? So that's the first half of polling. If I have 50 stores, all of them would accomplish the get cycle before we move on to the send cycle, right? Actually, one, one more thing happens in here. Once we have this bag, we, we process it in, right? That's the complete process. So process out, exchange, process in. That's one half of our cycle. That's one complete send. Then, of course, immediately after processing in, the main would go into processing out. So we got four stores, whatever. We sell an item at this store over here. So we had 10. The store says we have nine now, and then there's a receipt, and that receipt got into the mailbag, and that went over here, and that changed the main. Now the main knows that we have nine at that store, and that difference, that that store has nine, is then being pushed into an inventory bag, right? An inventory mailbag, so that all the other stores will know that that store no longer has that product, right? So that mailbag then, gets exchanged, a secondary exchange is launched and connected, and we send this over here, and of course we process that in. And that is the completion of the full polling cycle. In version eight, we run that every night at, at an appropriate time, meaning that obviously if we're doing backups or something, we gotta schedule around some of the other stuff that happens in the middle of the night, but it doesn't take that long really. I mean, you should be able to pull all your data in within half an hour or an hour. Um, the reason we also do the wagon wheel thing, if if we were polling, if because you can ha kind of have it go either way, I believe in version nine for sure. But anyway, in version earlier versions, version six, the main would have polled with one store, then polled with another store, then polled with another store. It would go sequentially, and that would take. Sometimes if you had a lot of stores, it would take three or four hours to get through the list. Then it would have to start over again to send all the data back out, right? And in version eight, they realized is they, they were able to accept concurrent connections. So they can have multiple stores using the exact same schedule and they can accept connections from multiple stores simultaneously. Um, the limit for the number of stores you can accept a connection from has to do with the bandwidth of your internet. So it's usually around 15, maybe 20, depending on how fast your internet is and how, how much data you can push through that pipeline. So, so go ahead, you had a question? All right, so um, then, all right, so um, back to our little uh, plan here, our checklist, right? So that's the basic overview. We looked at station files, uh, so scheduler, Right, the scheduler is, is, is tricky. The scheduler is often the culprit if you have a polling problem, right? So in the scheduler, we have to go in here and we have to check our, our, our schedule. And so it could be that our schedule has either failed or the scheduler itself has failed. So I'm gonna say definitely always check your scheduler. I'm gonna see if there's a, is there any chance that, oh yeah, so while we're at it, let's, uh, let's go take a look here. Uh, desktop, no, workstation one, no. My computer, yep, C drive, version eight. So your scheduler, you should have um, in the in the retail pro, R pro folder, there should be a sketch folder. That sketch folder is there to save your schedules. So if you, if you make schedules, like uh, we can look at these and see what's in these, right? Right. So there's a there's a remote schedule, 
I know it's a remote. Why? Because it's got two exchanges, right? So the remote, the remote has exchange one and exchange two. The main doesn't have two exchanges. The main, there's two, there's two sides to exchange. There's the send and then there's the receive. There's the pitcher and the catcher, right? So when, when the main launches it, it's a catcher. So the main only launches it once at the beginning and it's open the whole time. Um, and the main one, um, let's see, do, do we have any, do we have a main schedule? I don't know if we do, let's say open. Let's see what's in here. No, that's the run reports one. Open what's in here. That's also a remote one. Um, the main one, uh, what we do a lot of times is with, when we launch the scheduler at the main, at the exchange at the main, we usually don't have a run at it. We, 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 say, um, we say schedule it to run daily, and we say start at a certain time, and then we say close it. Typically, we close it. Like if we started at 12 a.m., we would close at 11.55 p.m. or something, right? So it'll be down for five minutes. Why bother closing it? Why not just run it forever? Well, because if Windows gets finicky and closes it, it's a problem, right? So we have to go and then relaunch it manually or, you know, a week could go by. We could be not polling. Accounting could be screaming and we're looking for the problem and we don't realize that that the exchange function just died. So, um, and so let's go into polling and let's launch exchange. Run indefinitely. So, and this could be minimized, right? We don't need this up, but the little lightning bolt down there in the bottom, that's exchange. So if our lightning bolt's running, then then our exchange is running right now if the exchange is running and you're still having trouble polling hey it's a computer right um restart the exchange like go down and and, and close this and and then go into your scheduler and in scheduler you basically want to go in and say run now right because if this thing launched at midnight it's been running since midnight um and if something's wrong with it, just right click, close it, then go back in and, and right click. Now, what happens if you don't? What if you just go in here and launch it in here and we say run indefinitely, then what's going to happen is it's going to be running tonight when um, when the, it launches again, right? Then you're going to have two two exchanges open. What happens when you have two exchanges open? They fight for the connection. Who wins? Nobody wins. You don't pull. That's what happens. So if you're running the scheduler, if you're running your exchange on the main through a scheduler and everybody is, you always want to launch it through the scheduler, right? You want to go into the scheduler and right click and say run now. You want to put it back in line. Now, if you think there's a problem with the exchange, you could go in, you could go, could go down, find it, close it, right? Then you could just open it manually like I did. You could say, Quick poll, tell me if, see if we connect. Oh, we're connecting. Yeah, it was the scheduler. It was the exchange. Okay, once it finishes polling, stop the, the manual exchange and go back into your schedule and fire it back up fresh, right? All good troubleshooting tips. All righty then, so go ahead. You have any question? Negative? All right, perfect. So, um... Log, yeah, got to love the log, right? Um, and of course, you can't close the scheduler. You can only minimize it. You can close it. You have to right-click and say shut down from, from the little icon tray. Um, that's DBS. That's not what we're looking for. We are looking for polling. Oh, right, we can't get to polling because... My exchange window is permanently open. We're going to close that. That gives me back in my polling menu. On the main menu, we got stations. We got logs, right? Yep, all right, that's a log. Not terribly exciting. Really dry, in fact. Um, X's, uh, red X's, um, indicate a serious error. 
All right, this is nice. We have a, a fatal windsock error here. A fatal windsock error or a fatal windows socket error. It's not a windsock, like it's not blowing in the breeze outside, right? Um, it's a windows socket error. And a windows socket error occurs when um, the remote exchanges, sends a signal over to the main, but the main exchange is, is not running. There is no exchange here. So what, what happens is there's two levels, right? So in, in, the, in, the, um, in the station file, form view, we say that we're going to connect on via internet, right? And, and when we say that, we then say what the main's IP address is, right? So what's, what's going on there is new. We're a remote store. We have a, a connection. We have a little router and a connection to the internet, right? And then on the, another part of the internet over here, we have the same thing going on. We have a little router and we have a, 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 a polling computer that we're supposed to be talking to, right? <clears throat> there is an external IP address right here, right? That IP address is typed into here so that, excuse me, then when we, um, when we poll, it says go find this address right here, right? Then inside the router, there's a thing called port forwarding or pinholing. There's a lot of words for it, but basically means forward. So when you see an, uh, a, a signal coming in on this IP on port 20,000, which is the polling port, okay, um, forward that to this machine here. That's how the that sets up, right? Now, um, when we put the IP address into the station file, right? When we say go to that address, Windows makes that connection for us, right? Windows knows how to find an IP address and to set up a connection so that this Windows environment is talking to that Windows environment. So that's layer one, right? So the first layer here is the Windows layer. Then our exchange, right? Our exchange reaches out over that connection and says, hey, Exchange, I need to send you some files. Well, this guy here is asleep. He's just like sleeping over here. There's little Zs coming out of him, right? He's not there. Lights are on, but nobody's home. Then we get a Windows socket error. And then our, our connection's forcibly refused. And the whole Windows thing shuts down. So that's that's a really common, by the way. In that case, either the Exchange is not responding, close it and reopen it, or it's actually not open at all right so okay right so the log <clears throat> lets you see all that crap there's way too much in the log that, that and now if you find an error like this you can double click it it'll it'll take you right to it if you want to see what's going on in a given polling cycle uh, find the the node here right and open it up and drill down and you can see everything that pulled over so all these here are files now when you're looking at these files it's hard to know what's important and what's not important right so I can tell you that that's an important one these two here are very important maybe important maybe not that's a customer file maybe important maybe not um, but I is invoice, receipts, N is inventory because I was already taken, right? And how would you know that if you wanted to know that? Well, um, you'd know that because there is a thing in Retail Pro called um, e-manuals. And you can go into the e-manuals menu and you can then go to the Retail Pro user's guide or the supplemental documentation. And if I go to supplemental documentation, it will give me a very nice menu, but I am going to point out that all of that is actually in um, the e-manuals folder. So if you just go inside Retail 8, open up e-manuals, open up docs. These are the menus you're browsing, by the way. There they are right there. So all the PDFs are right here. I can just go in and, and find them. So I could find a polling overview, right? And I could take a look at the polling manual and I could drop to the bottom, cruise back up a little bit. Okay, so right there, that tells you the naming convention, right? So the end tells you data class. 
right, what kind of file that is. And then up here, it should give you those data classes, right? So there's your, there's all your data classes, right? So what's an X? An X is employee clerk data or tax data, right? Uh, D is global preferences. W is store headings, right? So this is how you find out what that is. I is invoice, right? I is receipts, very important file. N is inventory, inventory differences, uh, multi is your quantity file, price, you have multiple price files in transit, min, max, and uh, index. So in, in, in an N file is a very important file. If you don't get the N file down to the remote, they don't get the new items, right? Q is a bunch of preferences. It looks like plan markdown scales. X is departments. I would not have guessed that. I think I had forgotten that X was department and vendors. It looked like they didn't know where to put that, right? Um, well, D, V, what do you do with it, right? X, I guess. Uh, so V for vouchers, S for slips, O for sales orders, because slips already took S, right? M for memos. Pretty straightforward, really. But still, it's handy to know. If you know the doc exists, and you know the overview doc has all that, and let's say you have a file, like in your polling, if we go back to Mr. Polling, and we look in here, uh, like in here, and I suppose I should do this, I can right click this and I can go to um, polling status and I can see files that are waiting. So I can see how many I received. Um, so let's just do, um, let's just do a process out. Is it going to process out? It may not process out. It won't process out, will it? No, it won't. It won't process out because I'm on a 64 bit operating system and the process out uses um a 16-bit application boom right so it's not going to process out for me today on this this installation in fact it's kind of very angry at me now um although real quick before i move on trans.exe that that is polling by the way that's that's the that's the polling application Excellent, thank you. So again, if, if I ha had to, I could launch polling without going through the Retail Pro menus, right? If I know that the trans.exe is, um, I just go in and find trans.exe and I could go right into polling, couldn't I? Of course, you have to log in, gotta provide current credentials to get in. But yeah, I can go right into polling. I don't have to go through the menus. Um, right, so um, in here, if you right click and go to polling status, you can see files that are waiting. If you see, if you find a file that will say not fully uh, uh, compressed or not fully decompressed, you could click on that. It'll open the folder. You could right click that, copy the file. You could move it back over to the like uh, in folder. You could bring it back over and put it in in received. And then try and re try reprocess it in. It may it may still fail. It may not fail. Depends on why it failed, right? So what if a, fa a file doesn't make it? What if it's a critical file? What if an I file becomes corrupt? I try and reprocess it. I can't get it to come over, right? Um, in that case, we have things in polling for that, right? We have uh, regenerate and initialize, and so. So those are really common tools in version eight. So version eight does not have a self-checking like file system. It doesn't send confirmation files. It doesn't reaffirm that we got the data, right? So in version eight, it basically compresses the data. Like in the case of a receipt, it checks off transmitted, right? And if you've ever been in, inside version eight, you know that there's a column of, um, I think I left that, that lockout on, didn't I? Oh, yeah, we can't see it because we can't see any of our history in here. That's so special. But transmitted is a is a checkbox that gets, and all that means is it was sent. It does not mean it was received, right? So, you know, FYI, that just means it was sent blindly, right? So if I need to 
resend data. So if I have an invoice file that's damaged, I can't get into it, and I miss a day's worth of sales, then what I would do is I would go to the remote, and in, in, the, in the station file at the remote where the data exists, I would choose to regenerate. So regenerate um, only the documents made on this station. If, if it has all history, I don't want to send stuff that the main already has back. I just need to send the stuff that I need to send from this store. Receipts or vouchers or slips, whatever, right? Um, for the date range I need to send. Now, if I am missing data on, let's say I'm missing data on the 15th and on the 12th, I might send, you know, the 11th through the 16th. Now, what happens if, if we send data that the main already has? Is it going to double sales? No. It's over, right? Ah, very close. No. Okay. Every, every receipt has a system ID. If the system uh, ID is already present, then the data is rejected. It's not allowed in. But you're basically right. It doesn't double. Right. But that's what a SID does for us on the receipt level. It lets us know that, that that's already made it. So really, when you're re initializing, you're kind of using a shotgun approach. I mean, you could do the whole month. It wouldn't matter. You're not going to hurt yourself. Now, there is an exception to that. Um, what if the index file was corrupted and it couldn't see the system ID? It would double sales. So if you deleted the index and then tried to process in a, uh, uh, a file, it might double the sales. But you could just do a re quick reconstruct on your sales file if you want to be 100% sure. I mean, I've n never seen it happen. I, I know it could happen in theory, but um, we've, I've never actually seen it happen. But they warned us about it when we got certified. So anyway, if we click OK, it would just process out. Of course, I'm on 60-bit operating system, and my process out is a 16-bit app, so it would go boom again. We will not be doing that right at the moment. Um, so that's that's sending data from the remote back to the main. Or could you use the re re initialize from the main to the remote? What if we lost the PC at the remote, set up a new one, and it, did, and it had no history. Hmm. Right, so so there's two things there. And that kind of leads into the next topic of initialize. What is initialize compared to regenerate? Well, regenerate just sends the, the, the history files over, right? Initialize sends everything else. So if I go in here and say, say send the inventory files, it would send everything, and yes, that would overwrite the files. So in other words, to process in, an initialized file at the remote, everybody would have to be out of our pro. Mm. So polling generally is very friendly. It's sharing the file. Initialize does not share, it overwrites. It wipes out what's there in favor of what I'm giving you. I'm the main, here's what your file should look like. I don't care what you think it should look like. That's initialize. So if you're setting up a second store, is this something that you would, I mean, if, or if you. Yes. Okay. If you're setting up a second store, the first thing you would do once you get the installation set up and polling set up is you'd go through and check off all of these for sure and just hit go and send it all over. Okay. Yeah. But now the other thing is if you're set, if you're, if you say you were buying a store, that's already established and you're wanting to combine inventories, would you still use initialize or would you use something else? Well, you, you, you got a bit, a bit of a bitch there. Well, I, I, we've done that by the way. So, so to make sure we're all on the same page with that one, if you, uh -huh. if you're buying a store, so you've got your store and your store right. has its inventory file and on right. row 100, whatever you have, you have this item here, but they have their inventory file. And on their row 100, right, they have this item here. Mm -hmm. You can't overwrite the file, or you're going to have to retag everything. <laughs> right. So what we do in that case is we usually we export this out, right, to an Excel spreadsheet, and we mm -hmm. take the um, like the item number, and we 
we bump it up to something like we could either do one because a couple of things we could do we could put a nail you and we could put a letter there or we could we could bump it up to row like nine hundred thousand so that mm -hmm. one, one is now nine hundred thousand one uh but you mm -hmm. want to kind of be careful you want to keep that simple as possible so like if you have a row 100 right and you say mm -hmm. that from now on in the alu field it's going to be a 100 right then what you could do is you could you could just type a letter a and scan that and it would find the item from the other store right so what mm -hmm. we'd have to do is we'd have to start retagging all the stuff we would have to import their items in a different section of the inventory. So the, the original items would be here and the new items would be down here and they might have special lookups. There might be a way that we, we, we type a letter and scan those old barcodes and that lets us find those old items directly while we're mm -hmm. retagging the product to get it into our main fold. Mm. Okay. I mean, it's a tricky thing. Is what it is, um, you know. Unless the, unless they had the same file, like uh, going the other way. Like if you're if you're a main and a remote, you could you could you could sever the connection and make this a main and break off on your own. And then if you were to come back, a portion of the inventory would be the same. Of course, the new stuff we'd have to do the same trick with. We'd have to take the bottom of it and import it in. It wouldn't wouldn't mm -hmm. exist. But yes, so for instance, you could, if you had a new store and you didn't trust their settings, you could say like, I'm not gonna initialize that, that's dangerous, but I am gonna initialize security and I don't think I'd wanna initialize customers. I'd probably wanna actually pull them in because customers would merge. Like they would they would all merge. Now, mm -hmm. if, if you're in the same neighborhood, you actually could have dupes then. I don't know what you do about that. There's no way around it. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're just gonna have to, you're just gonna have to pull them in and then you're probably going to have to go to DVS, and you're probably going to have to um, to dedupe de de the customer thing, right? There's a dedupe in here, I believe, someplace. Revision customers. I'm pretty sure you can dedupe that in here. It's been a while. Sorry. Um, I I'm know. Sorry. I know we could it's a whole other can of worms. <laughs> it is a whole other, but but that, that'd be the, the path you'd have to go. You'd have to be very careful. What right. I would strongly recommend is getting with a, a tech and sitting down and mm -hmm. looking at the right plan for your data to, to do that kind of thing. Because yeah, it's a pain in the butt. I mean, oddly, I'm, I have a store that's kind of going through that. Um, I'm working with Beretta right now, the the gun people, and they have two mm -hmm. stores, and and they're on version nine, but but they're 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 on version eight, bumping to version nine, but the corporate out of Italy wants them to use their inventory file. So they have to give up uh, their inventory file so they can become part of the corporation. <laughs> Which basically means they need to retag everything in the whole store and they got to import all their unique items. Yes. It's, just, it's a no. really painful process. Yeah. But you belly up to the bar, you bite the bullet, you get through it and you, um, and on the <laughs> other side, you're, you, you feel much better because now you have, now they can run reports out of Italy across the European markets and the Asian markets and the um, and the U.S. markets and items that that are pushed out from Italy are, are cross-reportable. So ultimately, you'd want to do the same thing. You'd want to have that ability to cross-report on on data and department codes, right? Their department codes right. would all be wacky and they won't mesh with ours. So there's a fair amount of work in cleaning that up. But you just got to jump into it and, and rip through it and and get through it as quickly as possible. And and we do we, we make decisions like if you have a men's department that has men's tops and bottoms and something, maybe we take men's tops down to polos, tees, and maybe we just take all theirs and say we create a, a men's top, an abbreviated version of our department mm -hmm. codes, and we put all their crap in that generic slot for now, so we get some level of reporting. But there's a lot of choices you have to make like that. Yeah. So, so initialization, real quick, and initialization, and very quick distinction. This this naming convention is terrible. Okay. This is a feature. Preferences 8.5 is a feature that was originally called in version seven remote preferences. So 
what is preferences h5 preferences h5 is if we went over here and found remote prefs and said define okay we're looking at a set of preferences for 001a well what are we really looking at what we're really looking at is in 001a under prefs these data files versus these data files up here right that's what we're looking at so there is a client file right here right client files right there and then there's client files down here so if you're not maintaining these if these are ancient like 2013 ancient right do not initialize them i'm just gonna say like people will go in and initialize stuff and uh and then break a bunch of things because they initialize this this remote preferences and they never go in there and maintain it this was a beautiful feature in version six and seven we did not have remote access in version six and seven in 1999 we did not have the ability to dial in or we barely had the ability to dial in and take over a computer remotely right so we had to manage all this stuff through the polling menus today why even bother like i would just go in to the folder out there and i would just go select all delete well, i wouldn't even have that liability hanging out out there waiting to bite me in the butt now if they send remote preferences nothing goes there's nothing to send so if you're if you're initializing don't do remote preferences don't do preferences 85 it was remote preferences were reintroduced into 85 that's why they called it that the programmer was a little short-sighted though um, so don't do that unless you intend to manage those remotely and i wouldn't i would just get a there's so many options on the web now to have remote access we use team viewer we used to use vnc there's log me in there's pc anywhere there's there's a plethora of choices out there most of them are subscription now and yes you need one but like with with team viewer you really only need one license and you install it on all your computers now what that means is one person can can sign into potentially multiple pcs right depending on your license but you only have one license only one person could be using it to dial into one or more pcs it's not the destination you're dialing into it's the person doing the dialing that uses the license does that make sense so mm -hmm. so the average company probably needs one or two um typically the owner wants to dial in at whatever three o'clock in the morning and do whatever they want to do and and then the tech support team needs one that'd be the probably the most logical way to do it so that the, the owner doesn't get bumped because that never works out well all right so back to our little thing here so we i think we understand the difference between initializing and, and and regenerating and yes we could regenerate history back to a remote we could initialize all of the inventory and all the basic preferences we could make sure that they're set up and then we could initialize their history back to them or regenerate their history back to them if i could use the um the correct phrasing um and of course i've kind of gone through most common problems as we went but windows socket error that's absolutely very very common uh in and the exchange at the main, like uh, locking up, getting locked up, that's very common. Uh, stopping your exchange and restarting it is uh, definitely a step I would do before I spend any money on tech support. It's so easy to do. The lightning bolt's down there, stop it, go back in to the scheduler, restart it. Say, Mr. Remote Store, quick pull, or just dial in and do it yourself, right? Mm -hmm. um, another really common problem would be uh, when you have remote polling and you have um, you have your main and you have your router the IP address changes either here or here it shouldn't by the way but I we've had a lot of things where somebody will like be switching from you know Comcast to Verizon or whatever and then they get a new router and suddenly they can't pull yeah Port forwarding is not set up in your new router. Look, if you're going to change anything on the network and you poll, make sure you schedule an appointment with one of our techs to be available during the time you're going to swap your network out, right? Because that's 
that's basic, basic polling. You got to be able to see the other location. If you can't see them, if you are at the remote and you dial into the to the other location, you stop there and you never get to this PC. You're not going to poll. And there's um, there is out there on now um, some tools we use. And I'm trying to think of it. And of course, my my little browser is not popping up. Why is that? Um, yeah, so see, there's tools here. Um, yeah, we're not going to be like doing that. Um, so there's tools out there though, that you could, you could check, you could say, check my port. And it'll tell you whether the port's open. Of course, the port we would be checking would be 20,000. Right, port 20,000 is closed on this computer. It's not open. Well, that would tell you right there that you're not you're not able to poll, right? And you can change that. So, like in in polling in here, if you go to options and you look at preferences, um, you can change what port you're using. I mean, it's not uncommon to change the port. Um, nobody really uses 20,000 for anything that I've ever seen. And I've never seen someone get hacked on 20,000, but it wouldn't hurt to change it as long as you change it all the way through, right? Mm -hmm. So, and if you ever try that, just make sure that, you know, that we're, we have a technician assisting with that and, and that the port forwarding and everything gets changed to use the new the new port setting. Um yeah, nobody. Well, in version eight, you could you could use you could use um, you could use um, a modem. Thinking and talking problem for me, obviously. Um, so you see number of redial attempts. You might want to set that down. If you're using a modem, you might not want to do 300 redial attempts. I mean, we've had clients that called in and complained that the store in Georgia called New York 300 times and was not successful. Right. Well, if you don't have free long distance, that's a problem. So, you know, not so much anymore. Everybody has free long distance now and, and uh, nobody really uses modems to pull anymore. Everybody just does it over the internet. So kind of a dead problem really. Um, yeah. I don't really play with these much. You know, purge log entries after 15 days is fine. I mean, nobody, you don't need a log entry that's nine months old. Like that problem's long been either fixed or is no longer an issue. All right, so that's that's pretty much my list of things that I got to go through today. Um, questions, anybody have any questions? Oh, we have a question out there that I missed. When is the end of Windows 7? Uh, excellent question. Um, Windows 7 ends on the 14th of January, 2020. How does that affect oh. Retail Pro 8 and Cayenne? It does not affect Retail Pro 8 or Cayenne per se, but it does affect your PCI compliance. So, you know, the odds are with us on this one. If you haven't been hacked, you're probably not gonna get hacked on the 15th of January, right? Um, what about the 15th of February? What about the 15th of March? Um, at some point, a vulnerability is going to be opened up in Windows 7 and Windows is off the train. They're not fixing anything after the 14th of January. So you would be vulnerable. If you were then to be compromised, if you compromised a credit card, which would be really hard because the Cayenne pin pad has point to point encryption. So I don't know how they're getting inside the pin pad and past the encryption. I mean, I think the odds are solidly with us on this one. But if if somebody like called in and gave a credit card number to an associate and that associate left it on a piece of paper and a customer got that and used it outside and it was determined that, that you guys had compromised their credit card, then they would do a PCI audit on you. You would not be compliant and the fines would probably bury you. 
So that's how it affects us, right? Um, you need to make a plan. Oddly, my neighbor just, his computer just died and he, he wanted to know if he should fix it. He was on Windows Vista. I'm like, no, just buy a new computer. <laughs> Less than 400 bucks. He has a Windows 10 PC. Um, he shopped poorly. He got a fourth generation PC on the Dell website. You can get a ninth generation PC for less than what he paid, but he didn't want to wait. Um, we have current PCs, Windows 10. Um, they're not terribly expensive. They're a little more expensive because we configure them for point of sale. So everybody knows what we do, right? With the hard drive. If you don't, I guess I could, should mention that real quick. Um, that the Q drive thing we did, um, can operate run on Windows 10? Yes, it can. Now, um, oh, that's that's our service person. That's Mary asking these questions. Thank you, Mary. All right, so um, so again, uh, if you're polling, what you've got to do is you've got to get a Windows 10 32-bit for the polling machine. You can't be 64-bit on and run a 16-bit application, right? So there's a limitation there on the polling machine. Now the polling machine does not have to be the server. And there's also an issue of, of memory, right? So so if you, have, if you have 16 gigabytes of memory, which I would wanna have 16 gigabytes of memory because we can now, right? But if you have a 32-bit machine, you can only see three of those. That's all 32-bit can see. It can see three gigabytes. That's all it can get. So I would want my server to be 64-bit. I would want my workstations to be 64-bit, and I would want the machine that manages polling to be 32-bit. And and to get that 32-bit Windows 10 machine, you're going to have to go through us. Nobody's going to have one of those. If you go to Fry's or Best Buy, oh, can I get a 32-bit Windows 10 machine? They're going to go, what? Yeah, not going to happen. Anyway, um, the other things we do, of course, is we take your hard drive and we partition it into the little pieces like that. And we put your C drive. I think we're up to like 100 or 110 gigs now on the on the C drive. Not 100% sure, but it's it's pretty high. Maybe 120 now. Because Windows is just getting hungrier and hungrier. But what we do is we, we put your operating system into the C drive and it's all pretty. And then we create a Q drive and we have a program, easy something, I don't forget the name of it, that, that basically takes a snapshot of that and we, we load that program on here and we put all those files in here, right? And so yeah, there's a little disk on the side of your, your box. And if you take the disk out and you boot to it, um, then you can you can um, restore the C drive. So it'll take all these, these image files here and it'll overwrite the data there. Now the rest of the drive is either an R or a D drive and is exempted from getting overwritten. It's, this is protected space, so so we're going to get we're going to get um, just overwrite the C drive. So if you get infected or if you get something going on with your Windows blue screen of death, you can just go ahead and and pop uh, pop that image over the top of the, the the drive. Then then the technician goes in, resets up your network settings or whatever your gets set back to the original settings. So you probably have to change a few little settings to make sure you can see our, our drive, map your drive back to your server, a few little things like that. But, you know, it takes five minutes to restore the operating system, it takes another five to set up your networking. You're back in business. Um, you may have to install a few drivers. You'd lose any applications. So don't save data to the C drive. Most cases, my documents is actually sitting over here. It's been redirected already. It's sitting on the extra drive. So you won't lose any documents, but you might lose, if you installed a Dropbox or something, you might lose that. So if you install Dropbox, and I've had this one happen, I've had people put Dropbox on their C drive. Don't do that. On a BHD computer, put Dropbox, redirect it to your R drive or your D drive. Because if it fills up this 120 gigabyte space here, then you you stop, your PC stops working correctly, right? And not only that, if we if we restore the image, it wipes the, the Dropbox out and you lose it all. So some some basics about PCs. But I'm going to say either make a plan to buy some PCs um, or get your PCs upgraded. I had a client call me from, uh, I think, Virginia. And uh, he had his tech guy on the phone. And his tech guy had the PCs. He'd already examined them. And he said, look, 
these ones here we can we can run an upgrade on Windows 10. It's pretty easy and probably won't blow anything up. And if it does, I can fix it. And these over here we can't. And these ones you need to buy new PCs on or we need to reformat them completely and install Windows 10 fresh. But make a plan like today because, you know, it's coming. And, you know, the first second week of January is going to be chaotic at best and getting an appointment in that time frame to fix your PCs is going to be a bitch. So if you're not on Windows 10 now, you should get on Windows 10. Now, Windows 10 is, is pretty good. Um, we can set Windows 10 up and we do set Windows 10 up to look and feel like Windows 7. Like the screen acts like Windows 7. It's got a My Computer icon it's got a network eye it's got it you you won't feel a pain that you did on windows 8 windows 8 was just a complete throw sideways and everybody was freaked out but windows 10 is actually very flexible it can look like windows 8 it can look like windows 7 it looks like a hybrid is what it looks like and it's very easy to use so i can't really say anything bad about windows 10. so, so I don't, is our pro version 8 working with windows 10. we can configure our pro 8 to work in windows 10. Um, oh, okay. Again, you got to have a 32-bit machine if you pull at least one 32-bit machine mm -hmm. on Windows 10. Okay. Now, Windows only supports three versions of Windows, right? That's why Windows 7 is dying, right? You got you got 8, 8.1, and 10. Those are the three versions that are considered active, which really they shouldn't even count 8. 8 was such a bad version, nobody wanted it. They should just throw that one out and say it's seven, eight point one, and ten. But that, that's not how they work. So, so Windows ten is out. Oh, excuse me. Windows eight, seven is out. Windows ten is in. And yes, make a plan. Get a local person who can run the upgrade. Who's like this guy had run hundreds of upgrades. He was very good at running upgrades. That's the kind of guy you want because an upgrade can go south. This is a pretty solid upgrade. I mean, they were doing it for free over the web, right? So they have it nailed down pretty tight, but there's there's still a few variables out there that it'd be wise to have someone who's experienced a, a number of these and seen all the problems assisting. Because I mean, this is a business. We're not doing this just so we can browse the internet. <laughs> so we want to make sure it's done correctly. Um, we would prefer not to, to to run the upgrade. If you sent us the box, we would wipe it and put Windows 10 on fresh. That's what we mm -hmm. would prefer to do. But there's a fee to do that. The Windows 10 upgrade is free. Or you can find a free, you can find it for free out there. If you need help with that, our techs could certainly show you. We had to talk about that in the, in the last tech meeting. Um, so, any other questions? All right. Well, I am going to tell everybody thank you and uh, have a great rest of your day, rest of your week, great weekend. You know, falls in the air. Thanks. All right. Talk to you guys later. All right. Bye-bye.